welcome back to another episode of Virtual Coffee. My name is Alexa Collier, and on this podcast, I interview accomplished and innovative early career professionals and small business owners. But here today on this podcast episode, I wanted to change things up a bit, and I have my husband here, Nathan Collier. Hey, everybody. And I wanted to have him on the podcast because he has a passion for finances and he's really taken me along our finance journey and really helped guide us along our finance journey. Um, of course, I also care about our finances, but he does a lot of the research and understanding the methods to go about your financial journey, especially at such a young age as we are. Today, I wanted to have him walk us through our financial journey and his advice to others, potentially our age, and just get into a financial conversation. Full disclosure, we are not professional finance folks. Uh, we do not have degrees in finance. This is purely our experience and our journey and our personal opinions. Uh, so we are not licensed professionals. Just wanted to make sure that was said. That's, you know, goes without saying because a lot of my financial knowledge and things like that, I mean, you got to put the quotes around that. Like a lot of my knowledge comes from uh, YouTubers, uh, Dave Ramsey, uh, probably one of the biggest financial gurus in the business. Personal favorite of mine is uh, Marco over at Whiteboard Finance, another YouTuber. And it's just kind of a lot of that knowledge that you can kind of pick up from these guys can be really valuable and putting it out in layman's terms so that I can understand really what they're talking about. Uh, because obviously the, the beginning goal of being post-college graduates, uh, barely entering the financial and the business side of the world, and trying to learn how to navigate that. And then, you know, this very vague end goal of being retired, financially successful, and all that stuff, they kind of help lay out those steps uh, so that you can really learn uh, what it is to be, you know, young and trying to, to take this journey. And the big thing for me was, I guess, just taking the first step because it seems, you know, kind of just talking about my history, I come from not a family that was like, not well off or, or, or poor or not really well to do either. It was a very much a family that was kind of middle of the road, but really never talked about finances and how to handle finances as a family. So this is something that I kind of just discovered all on my own as I really kind of just stepped into the world. And I've really got to thank Lex here because she's the one who got me started being interested in saving. And then I kind of took it from that, okay, I want to save, but how how do we make our money work for us is kind of where my interest took place. I wanted to start out by explaining our financial journey just to give the audience an idea of where we're currently at, where we were three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so Nathan and I have been dating for about three and a half years now, got married this past New Year's Eve. He is currently 25 years old. I'm 23. And as of right now, we are debt free. And we did that over the course of our relationship Nathan, if you just wanted to give an idea of our finances mm -hmm. and where we were and where we're at now, and that kind of lead take us through that journey. Um, I'm really the one who came into the relationship with the financial baggage. Lex luckily graduated with her college education paid for uh, by her family, and as well as you know a car with no debt attached to it. You know there was no more no payments to be made on the car. Uh, so when I came into the relationship, I brought with me about, I think it was what, $25,000 in student loan debt. I think it was like 30 in student loan. And then it was another, I think it was 15 on the car. And the car happened mm. in the middle of our yes. relationship. So that was 2018, I, mm -hmm. February, March-ish. Yep. My first car, I ended up totaling it. And that was being currently paid for by my parents. So... The other asterisk I think we got to throw at this is obviously I think we've made some smart decisions, us as a couple, as far as finances go, but also a lot of it is the luck of our situation. You know, so we've got very helpful family, Lex obviously graduating with no student loan debt and, you know, having a car that has no payment really affects how much we can do in a short period of time. But I think the, the bones of our process, you know, even if like it doesn't play out very similarly for you, the viewer or listener, a lot of those basics, you know, you can be, can be translated and, and put into effect, you know, in your own way. And especially as we 
become more and more financially independent from our families. Um, now I'm fully employed on my own out of college. So is Nathan. And as we start to buy a house and now our, I do want to thank my parents for allowing me to be debt free after college. That was like Nathan said, a huge accelerator in our financial journey that helped a ton. And we did also have the wedding, which of course mm. gave us some financial gifts, which were, were lovely and we're very mm. thankful for. But now as we're starting to head into, oh, what does buying a house look like next year? No one's helping us with that. That's mm. our own project. Yes, that's our own project. And yeah, as Nathan was saying, as we're becoming more and more financially independent, I think the lessons he's learning and applying to our finances will carry through our whole life. Let's go back to the start of our financial journey and really talk about when we first started becoming very interested in saving and planning our finances. I, of course, was always interested in saving money, but never really had a strategic plan. Uh, so Nathan, would you like to take us through when you first got started to get really serious about that? And then of course, I as well. Um, like I said, initially, a lot of my interest came from you. So Lex came into our relationship with already a decent amount saved. And I was very much the paycheck to paycheck person. I came into the relationship with recent college grad, you know, when we first met, Lex was still in college. I was a quote unquote, nine to five, you know, it was different hours, kind of crazy. But I was work basically a full fledged working adult, but uh, definitely living paycheck to paycheck. I had moved to Boston, um, where I met Lex, um, where we lived for a couple of years, with literally less than $1,000 to my name. I was very, very broke. All I had was the a job opportunity, uh, an apartment, and a place to you know uh, to rest my head and, and a car. And I was just trying to make it happen out there because I've always wanted to live in the larger city uh, kind and of honestly, atmosphere. And honestly, you, you were fine with mm -hmm. that, right? Because you didn't have plans of buying a house in five yeah. years, or you were just starting out your career in the yeah. big city of Boston and yeah. making good money and that was fine. Yeah, I was uh, what 22 at the time. At the at that time, I was excited about the fact that I had a job where I could order Grubhub. You know, like I was like felt like I was living the high life going paycheck to paycheck, making a decent amount of money and I could do really whatever I wanted. I could buy the video games that I wanted cuz I'm a huge video game player, but I wasn't really focused on any long-term financial plan. And I think that's kind of really where a lot of people are, is they're not really thinking about the fact they're paycheck to paycheck. They're, they're focused on the immediate. You know, they, don't, they haven't crafted a long-term financial plan. And then when Lex came into the picture, which was pretty soon after I moved to Boston, she brought with her, you know, and after we really started, after a couple, four or five months, I think, of dating, I really got an idea of your financial situation. And once we got serious. Yeah, once we got serious. So there's a lot of these early things that I picked up from her that, you know, her financial situation was different than mine. Which even is, background, too. Yeah, even, ba even background. Like, a lot of that stuff was, was different. You know, we grew up with different families, different lives, different knowledge. Um, and so for her, we when we really first started diving into this, it was almost like, she was like, really? Like, you're living paycheck to paycheck? Like, where is your savings account? Even though I worked three part-time jobs, making yeah. minimum wage at college, it's like, what the heck are you doing? Yeah, it was like, <laughs> she had more money than I could ever, like, hope to have you know it seemed at the time and so really it kind of that awoken something to me you know like i'm from the midwest which is a very man is the breadwinner kind of culture and obviously you know we as a society have moved beyond that and i move beyond that but a lot of those feelings and things like that like it's hard to erase you know what i mean so like seeing lex and she was like a lot more successful than me was honestly a little intimidating and also, you're coming from a place that it's $2 for a beer mm -hmm. and move to a place where it's anywhere from 10 to 15 for a beer. Exactly. So, <laughs> Granted, your your salary reflects that, but of course, it's still a it, shock value. It, it was a big change, you know, just the amount of money coming and going was very different. But after, you know, kind of talking to Lex about how she saved and everything like that, she was like, Nathan, you really should start trying to save. And so I was like, okay, you know, I'll just take a shot at it. You know, it was a very simple thing. I think my bank had like an online portal where I could just click a button and open a savings account. Like it wasn't like I had to do a whole lot of effort to do it. I have a question for you. When I first started telling you, oh, maybe you should try to save some money, build a savings account. Do you remember if you were thinking for what? Like what the heck am I saving money for? Because I, I wonder if that's why a lot of people are hesitant 
to perhaps start a savings account in their 20s or be really aggressive saving. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because there's a difference between putting $100 in it a year and putting $20,000 in it a year. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I think for me, and it's going to be a very different reason than anybody else probably ever would, a big part of the reason why I wanted to do it was because of you. Mm -hmm. Um, you, The fact that Lex had many, many thousands of dollars saved up compared to me where I had literally zero. I wanted, because as our relationship got more serious, we started talking about moving in together Mm -hmm. around this time. I felt like I was the one not really bringing much Mm -hmm. financially into the relationship. Again, it was this masculine egotistical thing at the time, but like I wanted to level the playing field. Um, So ultimately a pretty Mm -hmm. bad reason, you know, to do it. It kind of started me on this journey anyway. And then after a couple of months of actually saving, surpassing $1,000 for the first time, you know, the, the one time, yeah, the one time I had a really good month with work and I was able to save up, just put $1,000 in just at, all at once. There's a lot of these like tiny financial steps that ended up being super exciting, mm-hmm. super uh, interesting for me, uh, you know, really kind of got me excited about the whole idea. Uh, and then after a good... I guess several years because we saved for years like we didn't right, really do anything saved. with the money we would go on mm-hmm. vacations mm-hmm. internationally and use pull some from mm-hmm. savings just a little bit knowing that we did have that money to spend i think when we really started getting very serious about mm-hmm. saving and making a plan and making sure we're aligned on that plan was actually the beginning of this year yep. after the wedding so those expenses Granted, we didn't have many because mm-hmm. thank you, mom and dad. Uh, yeah. After the wedding, we knew that was over. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of the last big expense that was in the near future. Next mm-hmm. one was house. And we yep. knew that. Yep. So this past February, Nathan and I sat down for about two and a half, three hours and mm-hmm. had a serious conversation about our finances. And Nathan, do you want to talk us through that? Yeah. So... Really starting with, at this point, you know, like we had saved up just a ton of cash. We had just been throwing in a savings account and doing nothing with it because our plan, like Lex said, was we wanted to buy a house. I think it was initially me that started kind of like exploring. Definitely. Like these, like I said, I was watching these YouTube videos of uh, Mark over Whiteboard Finance, Dave Ramsey, just kind of looking at how to best handle my money um, and how to handle our money really at this point because we were married. And I was actually, sorry to interrupt, but I was very hesitant to have Mm -hmm. the conversation. I think Nathan wanted to have the serious financial conversation about three months, at least prior Mm -hmm. to February. And it just, even now, financial conversations just overwhelm me a lot. It's Mm -hmm. very hard for me to think about the future. Like, I know we need to hit this target in order to Mm -hmm. buy a house and have down payment. It just really overwhelms me because we're not at that target goal So Mm -hmm. I start to spiral and freak out. I'm trying to get better at it, but I was very hesitant to have that conversation. But once we did, I felt so much better and knew we had a plan, but just wanted to say that there, if you're in a relationship, perhaps one person has more of a passion for the financial Mm -hmm. plan, the other doesn't, Mm -hmm. but it is so important to come together and align on it. Right? Nathan never said to me, you need to be watching all these YouTube videos and catch up to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. He more just wanted to share his knowledge with me so we can agree on a plan. And that's what I think is important. Yeah. So a big part of the the conversation that Lex and I had was I had learned really finance 101, basically, or even a little less, like 101, 100.5. You know, there's not a lot of like knowledge here. I'm going to give you that you can't get from like basically any financial expert, you know, like this is pretty basic stuff. I'm just hoping, you know, with this conversation between Lex and I, obviously we're not financial people, so maybe we can kind of make it, you know, a little relatable, relatable, less intimidating of like an idea. And the big thing that we had learned, and I really got to, again, shout out Dave Ramsey here, was he talks about before you go buying a house, you know, working towards retirement and all these things you're better off just getting rid of rid of your debt. You know, like uh, obviously dumbing it down from financial standards, but if you pay off your debt earlier, that gives you a lot more cash flow every month. For an example from us, I had a car payment of about $350 a month. And then with my student loans, that's about another $350 a month. So just $700 a month was just debt uh, that we were just applying cash to. And then imagine if I had student loan debt, which... I'd say is more the norm yeah. for both people in the relationship mm-hmm. to have student loan debt. 
And also this doesn't just apply to people in a relationship. I understand our situation is different because we do have two contributors, but mm -hmm. this advice that Nathan's giving, of course, can be applied if you're working on your mm -hmm. finances alone. Yep. And so the big thing that really helped Lex and I kind of align was talking about the basics of this, you know, like, yes, you want to get rid of debt earlier before you take on new debt because that just limits your cash flow. The amount of money that you have available at any given time, you know, coming in per month, you're already allotting so much of that towards debt already, paying off your car loans, paying off your student loans, that now you're taking a mortgage on top of all that, you're very stretched. You become like what's like Lex calls like house poor. Basically, you know, you take on this mortgage, you know, for a house or whatever, and then you're already spending all of this money just to survive, and then you'll never be able to take it out. So you want to take the time that you can right now, which is the perks of being an early 20s professional making this kind of money, and apply this money while you can before you're married, or you can do this while you're married, but before you uh, have kids and things like that, they're going to be financial, you know, uh, expenditures. And this was very important for me to understand. And once I understood it, it became very clear why we should pay off our debt first. Mm -hmm. Because in my head, I was thinking, well, we have the money saved up for a down payment. We could mm -hmm. buy a house next month. Yeah. And by next month, I meant this past March, because yep. we were having this conversation this past February. And I didn't understand why we shouldn't just get the house secured mm -hmm. and then start working on debt. I was thinking everyone has debt. Everyone has a mortgage. Who cares? Yeah. Right. It's just another payment per month. Okay. So yeah. what? We pay rent every month. It's the same mm -hmm. thing. But once I understood that you should pay off your debt first so that you lose those monthly payments and those monthly payments can go towards savings mm -hmm. or paying down more debt, which I think Nathan's yeah. going to get into. Yeah. So the big thing that we looked into uh, and really kind of, I think, swayed Lex was we sat down with like a Excel spreadsheet, right? And we started talking about numbers and I started like talking to her about how interest works. She had a, a passing knowledge, but obviously, you know, could have known a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so we started talking about that and how that works in our specific scenario. We had two situations we kind of drafted out. One where we buy a house right now or situation number two, where we pay off the student loans right now, and, the and car. then and, and the car, and then from there, start working on building up a down payment again, and then paying off the mm -hmm. house. In that second situation, we would use the money we currently had saved in our account mm -hmm. and put that towards the debt. Yep. Minus, and this is my opinion, I always want 10000 in savings for emergency money. So we did yep. keep that aside as safety money. Yep. So I think that's important. So, yeah, I mean, and that's, a, again, you know, and that's another thing you'll find with any financial person out there. They'll say you want to have a three to six month emergency expenditure always set aside. Basically, if anything really bad happens, like you lose your job or something really unfortunate happens, like a major med uh, medical expenditure. You want to have a significant portion of your lifestyle money that you're required just to live uh, set aside so that you're not causing any major disruptions to, to your own life. Uh, you don't want to have to resort to a payday loan or something, some company like that that's you know, going to really target you and make your situation even worse just because you want to survive. So save up that savings first and then start doing what we were, we're talking about here. But the big thing was when we kind of compared situation A to situation B, pay off the loans now or get the house and then start working off, pay off the debt. I was able to show her through just how interest works and compound uh, interest and the, the snowball effect works. And I'll get into that in a second. We were able to pay off our debt in the first situation where we paid off our debt now and then target the mortgage many, many, many years uh, ahead of schedule as compared to if we got the house and then started paying mm -hmm. things off. So, it's basically delaying short-term gratification. You know, we want a house, so we're setting ourselves back by a year. And in return, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we're completely debt-free. You know, we bought a house, that house is all, and the mortgage is now paid off, and we're not dealing with paying off a house, paying off student loans and everything, while also trying to raise a family. Right, as opposed to having that debt until we're in our 40s, mm -hmm. and now we have kids who are yep. going off to college, yep. and that's... Yeah, and, and I don't want to go out and say that, like, you know, if, you've, if you are married or you, you do have kids, you know, like, your financial situation is not shot. It's just right. the sooner you start doing this, the better. Very much with money and finances, the earlier you start it, and, and this is key, 
every month, every year that you can get out ahead of it and start this sooner rather than later, it's exponential in mm-hmm. how much this changes, you know, 30 years from now. And of course, this podcast is dedicated to those early on in their career. Mm-hmm. So this is also why I wanted to have this conversation because Nathan and I are both early career professionals right now. Just talking about this from our perspective to give advice to those in a similar situation or mm-hmm. not at all. Yeah, and that's a good point too. You know, like hopefully everybody, you know, listening is is within this kind of, you know, that's like in this early career development stage because... The good news for you is if you can start doing this now and, you know, not delay putting a little extra on your student loan payment, the sooner that you're going to be in in a really, really good financial place. So it'd be great if you could explain the snowball effect similar Mm -hmm. to how you explained to me a couple months ago. There's two kinds of, again, as far as I know, this could, there could be many, many more, but there are two major kinds of debt tackling strategies. Uh, the first is the snowball effect, and the other one is called the avalanche. And they're basically the polar opposites of each other. The snowball basically means, uh, imagine rolling up a snowball, right? You, you start small, and you get bigger, and you get bigger, and you get bigger, you know, and then you've got Frosty the Snowman in your front yard, mm-hmm. right? Like, you start small, but it gets bigger. And that's really kind of the, the snowball effect in, in regards to paying off your debt. You start off with the smallest dollar amount debt that you have. If you owe $200 to AT&T for your iPhone, you pay that off. And then same thing with your your car is your next smallest one. And then you got those big old student loans. And then maybe you have a house, and that's by far and away the biggest. That's the last one you tackle. But you what? just start small and work your way up. So why is it important to start with the smallest debt mm-hmm. in terms of the dollar value mm-hmm. as opposed to the one with the largest interest? Because that was confusing to me at first. It's one part finance, one part psychological here. Many, many people will start their financial journey and have a good couple of months and then some big life expenditure happens that then causes them to deviate. You know, maybe their car breaks down, they got to dump a couple hundred dollars in, you know, repairing the brakes and then they don't get back on. You know what I mean? They, they start this journey off and then they give up because something happens, life gets in the way. And so this is why one of the major reasons many financial gurus advocate for the snowball effect is because in the beginning, it gives you a lot more immediate victories. Hmm. So say you have a $500 credit card bill that you got to pay off, you can tackle that in a month or two, hopefully. As opposed to the $300,000 house Exactly. So if you're tackling your mortgage early on, that's going to take years. Hmm. So it's easy to kind of like lose lose sight of that financial goal. And I can personally speak to it that by paying off my debt, paying off my car loan, paying off the student loans, I am way more interested now that we're about to take on a, a whole house mortgage. Like that's going to be our next big target. But I'm really interested in already getting that paid off just because of the successes I've seen with the snowball effect. And really, the other financial aspect of it, you know, we looked at the psychological, let's look at the financial now. The financial part of it is that. If you start off with your smallest debt, you can pay off that $500 credit card loan pretty quick. Say that credit card's minimum payment per month is 50 bucks. So you pay that off in two months. Two months, that money's gone. You've paid that $500. From that month forward into the forever future, that's $50 per month back in your wallet to then start applying to other debts. And this is where kind of the snowball effect takes place is you free up money from debts that you're paying and you apply that to the next largest debt. So say we just paid off that $500 credit card and say one of our student loans is for $5,000. Now that $50 per month, we're now also putting towards that $5,000 student loan. And a year, that's another 600 bucks. So you just keep doing that and then you free up that $5,000 student loan with the $100 a month payment. And now that's $150 between the two that you're now taking towards your big student loan, which is 15,000 or 25,000 or whatever, and that's an extra 150 bucks you're throwing out every month. So for us, this really kind of helps us now start to tackle our mortgage because we put $700 a month back in our wallets Mm -hmm. by paying off my student loans and paying off my car. And that's exactly how we were able to pay off our debt in three months, I think. Through that snowball effect, we knocked out Nathan's car, like he said, that gave us back $300 that we could then put towards our student loan debt. The next thing I wanted to talk about with you is behavior change. 
What's your advice for people who pay off that credit card debt, just going with that example, and get $50 back every month? What's your advice to them to not then go spend that 50 bucks on new clothes every month mm -hmm. and instead put it towards your debt or savings? I, I think it all starts with the kind of your mentality on it all. Um, obviously, it'd be very easy to see that you paid off your credit card. And more often than not, I've wanted to also be that person. We paid off our debt and you know we've done all these great financial things so far in our life. And part of me wants to go and buy a whole new wardrobe, you know, upgrade my clothes, do all these fun things because I feel like I deserve it, you know, or whatever the reasoning may be. But a lot of that self-discipline has to come into play. You'll develop these tendencies as you take your financial journey. You know, you'll work your, your butt off to pay off these debts, pay off these credit cards. And as you get more into the rhythm and the tempo of doing something like this, it's much easier to see your whole view on money kind of change to align with what you're trying to do. You're not going to want to go and spend a thousand dollars, you know, on Gucci shoes after you just spent a thousand dollars paying off your credit card. You just got out of that mess and now you want to hop right back in. Once you've kind of settled in on this mindset, it's really easy to, to deny, deny yourself things that you don't see an immediate return or an immediate need to have. For us, it's, or for me at least, it's stick to it, pay off the small debts, work your way there, and then the mindset kind of comes. Uh, and that's been my own experience. I also think that's an important balance to find, whether it's with your partner or with mm -hmm. yourself, the balance between having fun with the money that you now put back into your pocket versus saving it for that long-term goal. So mm -hmm. for example, I'm very intense with our savings mm -hmm. and I go through moments where I think, why would we go get that $10 ice cream once a month when that $10 could go towards our down payment mm -hmm. for our house? I can get very intense with it. And Nathan's more on the looser end. Yep. While he has changed over the course of our relationship and is also very dedicated now to our savings, which is great. He is able to say, Lex, we can afford a $10 ice cream. Yep. We're not getting it every single day. This is an every other week thing. We can go get ice cream. That's okay. Because you want that balance of you still have to live your life and have fun and be happy while also saving money for those long-term goals that will make you even happier. So our next goal is our house, which mm -hmm. is very intense savings right now. But does that mean we have to be miserable for the whole year and not buy absolutely anything except food and our rent? No. Yeah, I mean, because the way that you really got to think about it, too, is you. there is the immediate financial benefit, yes. If we denied ourselves everything that made us happy, everything fun that we wanted to do for a year, 100% we will be much closer to our home buying goal a year from now than we would be if we just go and get everything that we want. That's just math. But at the same time, you've got to find that healthy balance because you're still living your life, right? That's still one year of 80, 85 human year experience that you're going to have on this world. You don't want to just deny yourself everything that makes you happy and everything that you enjoy just to save up as much as physically possible. Enjoy your life, but be a, as frugal as you can within reason. Uh, and then save, 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 put money towards your debt. Because it's not like, granted, we're young and we paid off our debt very, very young, but either Lex or I will tell you, we have not been as frugal as we could have been. You know, there are many times we'll go out and have a nice dinner. We'll do dinner and a movie on a weekend, you know, pre-COVID. Uh, so we did a lot of these things, you know, week in, week out. We could have been a lot more financially dedicated than we have been, but we're young. We want to enjoy our lives. We want to do fun things. And so we're going to spend the money. Everybody makes a wage, right, that, that has a job that's going out there, you know, working day in, day out, part-time, full-time, double hours, whatever it may be. You've got a paycheck that you're collecting, hopefully, that you're then trying to take that uh, amount and put it towards paying for your rent, your food, your debt, your savings, uh, long-term goals, short-term fun, vacations. There's a lot of places to take this money that you know, you've got to find a way to balance all this to pay off your immediate needs. Like you got to pay for rent and everything first. 
and then savings and everything comes and then you're fun. But you've got to really sit down and put together your budget. And for us, it was a very not fun thing to realize. We spent a lot of money going to Dunkin' every weekend or something. So a lot of that, a lot of that wasted money kind of comes to the forefront when you realize, yes, I went to Dunkin' and I like going to Dunkin' and getting you know a coffee every weekend, but it's been a year later. We spent like five hundred dollars going to Dunkin' over the last year, and if I had not gone and done that, and I had a five hundred dollars in my wallet now. Now I'd be a lot happier with five hundred dollars than I would be with going to Dunkin' every weekend. And the difference is, we now go to Dunkin' once a month. Yeah, we're not completely denying ourselves of that treat. We mm -hmm. still enjoy going to Dunkin', but do we need it three times a week? No. Yeah. We can make coffee at home, and that's just as good. Exactly. And I think a good example of also the balance is Nathan's really nice computer monitor has a scratch in it which sucks and eventually he will need a new monitor but does he need a new 500 to 800 dollar monitor right now no because yeah. his monitor is working perfectly fine as much as it's... i would disagree with that you know i think i do <laughs> no, need that right know. now <laughs> but seriously you yeah. can still do everything it's not noticeable the pixels aren't whack yep. it's not distorting the screen Mm -hmm. On the flip side, though, his glasses recently broke, and they're currently super glued together. Yeah. So do we want to spend that 300 to $500? Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's really sitting down with yourself and saying, you know, just for easiness to walk through this example, we're going to throw a number out there. Say you're making $2,000 a month. That's your after-tax wage, you know, to, to put towards your rent, put towards your savings and everything. You've really got to think about this as mathematically as possible. So you sit down, you pay your rent, you pay your utilities, you pay for your gas, the whole nine, and say that leaves you with $500 left over, you know, after you've gone grocery shopping and everything, but before you've done anything fun, take that money and set aside what you feel like is a, a I would say somewhere between making you uncomfortable and something that you would find easy. Just that something's going to make you feel slightly uncomfortable financially, and that needs to be your savings number. However much you can just push yourself a little bit to push as much as you can into your savings account and look at it as if you're paying like your rent or your cell phone bill. It's a required bill that you have to pay every month. Like this isn't optional. Savings is something that's just, it's a bill you're paying. You're automatically depositing that money. And if you can set it up for automatic deposit, you're just automatically pulling that money out of your checking account and just right into a savings account. And build up that savings as much as you can. Get yourself some emergency money set aside and then start tackling that debt. Because the, the very, very real thing is Lex and I, we, we have good jobs and we can pay off our bills and everything and have a ton of money left over to save over the past couple of years and now to put towards this debt. Now that the debt's gone, if we chose to just live in, in like that paycheck to paycheck lifestyle, We'd be infinitely better off now than we would have been three years ago because there's $700 a month that is now back in our wallets. And that is not a small amount of money. I could go buy two PlayStations a month and just throw them in a wood chipper, you know, <laughs> and that would be – we'd still be in the same financial situation as we had been two years ago. That's a ton of money to then take and do, do other things with. You know, you can save up a ton of money off $700 a month. And so a big thing for us was – now that we've accomplished this goal and we've paid off this debt, it's much, much easier month over month over month over month over month to save all this money up and build up a large down payment on our house. Mm -hmm. Which is the next goal. Which is the next goal. Because here's the other very real benefit. A mortgage is cheaper than rent, first and foremost, nine times out of ten. Once you have taken on a mortgage, a decent amount of that mortgage is going towards your debt. So when you take out a mortgage, as opposed to renting, you are paying towards owning a house with a mortgage. So a lot of your month, uh, monthly payment is going towards the mortgage you've taken out to then ultimately pay off the house. And you no longer have to pay anything every month because you've paid it off. You're now in complete ownership of your home. The other good, bad part about renting is that you are taking X amount of dollars every month and you're paying it to some person or corporation that owns the house that you're living in just for the perk of living there. Uh, and while 
long term, many, many people will disagree or argue over the benefits of renting versus owning a home. The very, very clear thing is in retirement, it is always going to be more mathematically advantageous to have owned a house that is now paid off as opposed to renting because it's much it's a much smaller drain on your month to month budget. If you're looking at it from a financial perspective, yes. which is how we're looking at it. Yeah. So the big thing for us is we want to get this house bought and then immediately start trying to pay it down as fast as possible so that when we are 35, 40 years old, we are debt free with no rent payment and no mortgage because we are living in a house that we have bought and paid for. And then our minimum monthly expenses are as small as physically possible. Cars are paid off, student loans are paid off, house is paid off. All we're paying every month is utilities, Wi-Fi, gas, food, and fun. And that's a- Kids. And kids, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but basically you, you, you can't pay off kids though, right? So like you're, you're basically just like trying to minimize and get rid of like the, any debt you physically possibly can. Uh, you know, get rid of all of that from your life as fast as possible because all that is is a negative financial drain. You know, interest rates are the bane of your existence that if you're paying 7%, you know, on a student loan payment or whatever the number is, I think it was four and a half for us for the average student loan debt. But that's four and a half percent every month that, you know, you're you're losing money. That is a huge drain on on your assets. So getting rid of that stuff as soon as possible and as fast as possible is really, really going to benefit you in the long run because uh, you're not letting interest do its bad thing, you know, where you have a debt and you're just generating interest over time uh, and you're going to just have to pay twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 on top of your student loan payments just in interest. It's a really, really bad negative financial drain. So to summarize, is your number one piece of advice to... One, get your debt paid off as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have debt, start saving for your next financial goal. What would you say your number one advice is? Kind of summarizing it into like a quick or 10 second blurb. Pay off your debt. Once you're done with your debt, if you haven't bought a house and you want to buy a house, save towards buying a house. And once you've paid off the house or if you're going to rent for the rest of your life, that's fine. From then, start taking your money and putting it towards very safe investments. We haven't talked about this much, but the ultimate goal for me and for Lex is to build to build up an investment portfolio that's going to start making us money. You know, now interest is doing the good thing. You know, where we're making money in interest instead of losing money to interest uh, from debt, we're now you know have assets and investments that we're working towards. Build that up as much as possible and try and get yourself as young of an age as you can into a cash positive lifestyle where instead of after you've calculated out your losses to utilities, groceries, all that stuff, all the money going out, you're now making more money from investments, passive income, that kind of stuff that's going to mm -hmm. generate you a ton of return and value. Once you're at that point where your investments are making you more money than you're spending, you can retire hypothetically, you know, theoretically at that point, you no longer need a job. And the big part right now with Lex and I, it's a huge emotional benefit for us that we no longer have to worry about this debt over our head. So getting rid of all that stuff as fast as possible and kind of settling yourself into long-term financial goals is really, really beneficial to your mental health as well. And once we start our investment journey, perhaps we can do another podcast episode on that. Before we close out here, what is your one resource you would suggest those who are just starting their financial journey to go to? Is it Dave Ramsey? Yeah, 100% uh, Dave Ramsey. And while there are a lot of things that after I've started this financial journey, I don't necessarily agree with him on. The one thing that me and everybody else can agree, you know, because financial experts, they have very diverse views, right? There's a lot of different, they're, they're all individuals that have opinions and on what works and what it doesn't. But Dave Ramsey is by far and away the most accessible uh, financial expert out there. If you are very interested in starting, you know, your journey, 
I strongly recommend that you go on Dave Ramsey's website and look up his seven baby steps. It's the seven steps to retirement. And it starts off very, very simple, very, very easy to do. And it literally walks you through the seven steps you need to take to get completely financially free. And it's as easy as you can make this, right? It's it's minute read. I strongly recommend everybody go and look at that. Great. Well, thank you, Nathan, for joining me here today on this episode of Virtual Coffee. Again, this is purely our personal journey. Just wanted to share our experience because I know I would have liked to listen to people similar to us or similar age as we were going through the beginning steps of our financial plan and strategy. So just wanted to share our journey. We know that everyone's financial journey is completely different. So take this advice as you wish. You can find both myself and Nathan on LinkedIn if you'd like to connect with us and continue the conversation. Nathan Collier, Alexa Collier. You can also find the podcast on Instagram and Facebook at Virtual Coffee Podcast. You can listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean. And don't forget to rate and review the podcast on the Apple Podcasts app. Let us know how you like this episode and if you'd like to see more episodes like this one. So thank you, Nathan. Yeah, thanks for having me.